Hey everyone, I'm Dutch, so I'm starting on time. Goedemiddag. I had to check what time it was because I don't know when I am. I am Nicole van der Hooven. Hola a todos. Uh, magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. I am a senior developer advocate at Grafana Labs. So I think it's really hard to be here at KubeCon without hearing the word observability. It's such a weird word because it's something that we don't typically use in our ordinary lives, but when we're talking about the health of our systems, for some reason, it's everywhere. We turn into voyeurs. We don't just want to watch. We also want to watch the watchers. In fact, we're so paranoid about it that we employ all sorts of things just, so, just to make sure that we can observe everything. But I want to challenge that. Because I don't think observability should be the goal. I think, in fact, that we're focusing on the wrong thing. If observability is your end goal, then there's something wrong with your plan. So this is an actual screenshot of a production incident that we faced at Grafana Labs. Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Um, this is uh, something that happened at Grafana to one of our clusters, our Mimir cluster. So this is a, a metrics time series database. And um, you can see there are very scary things there. There are three spikes. For some reason, we experienced a surge in traffic. Bad stuff happened. We did the thing of turning it off and on again. That worked a little bit for a while. And then suddenly, it worked. It recovered. We had everything instrumented. Everything was observable. We had the data. We could graph it. We could visualize it. Did we fix it? No. Observable. Usable? Mm, not really, because this was a recurring issue. In fact, this issue cost us $100,000 over a couple of years. And yet, we are very observable. We are the observability company. So should observability be the end goal? I don't think so. I think the end goal should be something like continuous reliability. It's kind of like, actually, when you think about it, saying that the grade that you give to a student is, you're very gradable. What does that mean? That means absolutely nothing useful is what it means. Anyone who's played a fantasy RPG knows that you get the best weapons at a blacksmith. That's because a blacksmith has a forge. A forge is something like a furnace where you go to get your metal hammered and heated into something better, into something harder. It could be a sword or a battle axe or something even more awesome. Um, but the thing is, we, when we think of our systems, we almost expect them to be perfect right away, when in fact they have to go through this forging process. So even a company like Grafana Labs has to go through a forging process for our own systems. We don't try to jump to the end. We kind of build up incrementally. And hopefully, we come up with a weapon that is incrementally stronger each time. So I think we should, have, we should think of something like a continuous reliability forge. I made this up entirely because the acronym was cool. First, we should have a framework, a resilient infrastructure design. If the design isn't good, then you know all of the observability isn't going to do you any much good, really. So the next one is O for observability. <laughs> you still need that. Um, it is a means to an end. One of the means to an end, it is not the end in itself. There's recovery. What do you do when something fails? There's growth. Do you learn from your mistakes, or do you just keep turning it off and on again? And there's E for engagement. The culture of reliability in your company matters. I'm going to give examples for how we do all of these, but first, maybe let's talk a bit about what we do at Grafana Labs. You might have heard of Grafana. That is the pink thing in the middle. It is a visualization tool. We do dashboards. But that's not actually all that we do. Because Grafana does not store anything in itself. You can visualize things with it. You can make pretty graphs with it. But it doesn't come up with the data. So we have a bunch of other things for collecting the data and for storing it. This is not 
all our stuff that we own, everything here is open source. And some of them, like Prometheus, for example, is not ours, but we maintain, we employ majority of the maintainers for it. So we consider it as part of the stack. Everything here is open source, but we do have a hosted version of all of these, and we call it Grafana Cloud. So our customers, if they choose to become customers, you can still continue to use Grafana, the Grafana stack, completely free if you want to host it on your own. But if you are one of our customers, we maintain these for you. We put them on our cloud. It is our problem if stuff goes down, and we fix it for you. So. The first one for the forge is the framework, a resilient infrastructure design. We've got these four time series databases here. This is, we're, we really love our acronyms, that's why I went to the forge acronym too. Um, LGTM, but really these ones, LTMP, are the time series databases. L is low key, but it's also for logs. T is tempo and it's for traces. M is Mimir and it's for metrics. And the P is Pyroscope and it's for profiling. So I'm not gonna go into all of these, but know that within these four, we're trying to maintain somewhat similar um, designs for all of them because we know what works. So this is a thing for Loki. There's, there's a lot on this and I'm not gonna go through everything. But you can deploy Loki as a monolith, single binary, or you can deploy it in what we call microservices mode. This is what I would recommend if you're running something in production. The cool thing about this is if you want to scale it up, you can scale just the component you want up or out, and you don't have to duplicate everything else. So as an example, um, you have a separation between the distributors and the ingesters. The ingesters, so that's like actually part of the, um, the, those are the components that actually take in your data. And then the queriers are the ones that help you find stuff within that data. So you could scale one up and not the other or vice versa. Having this from the beginning really helps because even if you don't, mess with any of the original of the config that we recommend, then later on, it leaves room for that growth. This is also how we've managed to scale our internal Loki clusters to process 324 terabytes of logs a day. That's just our stuff or our customer stuff and our own meta monitoring stuff. So we have something called Grafana Enterprise Metrics, and that is the hosted solution for Mimir. I want to talk about a particular outage <laughs> that we've faced in this. We have about 15 large Kubernetes clusters of gem around the world, and those clusters are multi-tenanted, so the customers, some customers are still using the same instance. And because Mimir is super scalable, it can handle this really well. Except when it doesn't. Do we have these limits set into place to prevent any one customer from overwhelming the rest of the, the instance and the rest of the cluster? But one time it didn't. And we had a two hour outage for everyone. <laughs> See, what happened was we didn't realize that our error paths for when that limit is reached by a, a certain customer um, they're actually more CPU intensive than the happy paths. We didn't plan for that one. And so because of that, it caused a cascading failure, which is not a good thing throughout the rest of the stack. So we had some solutions. First, we fixed that bug on the limits, but then we also had to do something about this so it wouldn't happen again, even if that error occurred again. So what we did was we used our own load testing tool, K6, to hammer this thing. And we got it up to 1 billion, 1 billion time series um, for Mimir. So the next one is observability. We also have to think about how we instrument everything. We have so much. We, we both monitor and also are a microservices architecture-based um, system ourselves. Uh, and, and so we have to 
think of how we can do this more efficiently. We use things like Bela, that's the B at the top. We use Otel, open telemetry, and we use Alloy, which is our flavor of the Otel collector. We also do some manual instrumentation. It's actually really cool because at Grafana, when you start a Kubernetes cluster, it's already automatically instrumented and you can get things like continuous profiling from Pyroscope right away. You don't even have to think about it. Having that already set up for me is, is great because that means that I don't have to repeat the work that other people have done. This is an actual dashboard that we use to monitor our own stuff. This is our Ops Mimir cluster. Check out the 14 million samples per second that we ingest. <laughs> it's pretty cool. We are the largest uh, Mimir cluster in the world, but I mean, it is ours, so that kind of makes sense. We use Mimir to monitor Mimir. We use our stuff to monitor our stuff. We actually do quite a bit of meta monitoring. In fact, we've strayed a bit into paranoid territory, but is it actually paranoid if it's happened? <laughs> if bad stuff has happened, then that's just being proactive to monitor your own stuff. Okay, so let me explain this a little bit. On the left box is our production cluster. This is the stuff that we need that our customers pay us to keep up. On the upper right is our operations cluster. That's the stuff that we use to monitor our production cluster. In our, in our operations cluster, we use real production data. So this is not a test environment, and we, but we still do use it to test stuff. So one recent thing that we've tested on it is adaptive logs. We have this thing where you know you have a lot of logs and that costs a lot to maintain and to store. And we have this feature where we drop a lot of your logs that you don't use. And yet we found it really difficult when we were trying to convince other teams to let us drop their logs. So these are the things that we didn't really think about. Like how can we expect our customers to sign up for something that can potentially drop logs if we can't even convince other teams to do it within Grafana. This is one of the benefits of dog fooding your own stuff. Turns out we had a lot more education to do and a lot more cultural understanding cross teams. So the ops cluster monitors the monitors. So we also have logs, uh, metrics, and traces. And then we also have, for every instance of Prometheus, we have a meta Prometheus. It's an HA pair, highly available pair. And one is usually in the American Americas, and the other one is in Europe. So they always operate in pairs, and they scrape each other and the alert managers. There are also two alert managers. It's a global cluster, but there's one instance in, in the US and another one in Europe. We're trying to keep them geographically distinct. We also have a Prometheus that is monitoring the Mimir that we're using to monitor Mimir. <laughs> you see where the paranoid bit comes in? <laughs> still highly available. There's still an HA pair attached to that. We also use on call. So on call is the, the, the one on the right with the arrow. That's like our incident response management tool, open source. Um, and we use it to handle the on-call rotation. And when something happens, when an incident is declared, it gets, there's, we discuss that in Slack. One of the problems that we, we came across is, what happens if on-call goes down? Guess what, we don't get alerts. <laughs> Nothing gets escalated. We don't get an incident declared. So now we have a kind of dead man switch mechanism it's actually a separate service that we don't own or maintain. It's called Dead Man Snitch. This thing, we send a, a, like a heartbeat to. We send a message, and if that message does not get sent, then that means that on call or some and maybe something else before it is down. And then it, if that happens, Dead man snitch is going to go and alert our engineers through their own stuff. It's kind of weird that we do have a tool that does this, 
But just to be really, really sure, we're using another tool to check on us. I mean, that's, that's what it takes for us to be really secure in that this is going to work. This is a failover plan. And by the way, all of this exists across three cloud providers, because why not? AWS, GCP, and Azure. So there are headaches involved in that. In fact, all of this costs a lot. 13% of our own costs are just for our own observability. They're not for delivering the services to our customers. They're just observing what we've done. So the next part is recovery. We use, as I said, something called on-call. It manages the on-call rotations, um, and we, it also does auto-remediation for some common issues. So this is an example of what that looks like. In this case, we know that um, this database disk needs to be scaled up sometimes. So there's a workflow for it where it is automatically detected and um, there's a remediation workflow that is triggered through GitHub Actions and Terraform. It also lets us, uh, so that basically upscales a disk without us having to do anything. And we're hoping that that fixes the issue. This is only something that can occur for the most common issues. Sometimes, a lot of times, our engineers will still have to be paged. And then they're going to have to try and, and troubleshoot. We get alerts on snack, uh, Slack, <laughs> maybe I'm hungry, and <laughs> the mobile app. And also, uh, an interesting thing is that every team at Grafana is responsible for what they build. So it's not like you know the Loki team or the Mimir team kind of chuck the code over the wall to the platform people who are then responsible for deploying it. No, the Mimir team is responsible for that because they need to know the pain of actually maintaining the thing that they're building. And so they have a vested interest in making that easier. And then for growth, there's a, a lot that we do for continuous improvement and continuous testing. So these are three tools that we use. Two of them are ours. The first one's K6. It is a load testing tool, but it's also more than that. It does browser testing. It does chaos testing. You can use it to run any kubectl command. So in fact, within a test, you can use it to apply or, or delete config within the test, maybe based on the results of the previous test. K6 is used for a whole lot of our stuff. K6 is the team that I actually joined before we were acquired by Grafana. There was a lot of synergy already. We had kind of like a deal with Grafana where they got to use K6 and we got to use Grafana because we figured out that K6 is a really good way to test Grafana and Grafana is a really good way to visualize K6 results that kind of worked out that way. That has extended to, like I said, K6 being used to load test Mimir. It is used to load test Loki as well and a bunch of other systems. It's now also used for the synthetic monitoring product that Grafana Cloud has. The next one is Faro. Faro is our front end observability tool. And um, it is used for the front end observability of Grafana Cloud, on call, synthetic monitoring, and a bunch of other stuff, including the Kubernetes monitoring app, actually. And then Keda, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that because it's not ours, but it is what we use to auto scale our stuff. And there was an issue before where we were using Mimir to hold the metrics to determine whether or not to upscale Mimir. That's not a good thing because it, it's self-referential. So now we have a Prometheus instance that monitors Mimir. And the Prometheus instance's job is just to hold the metrics that Keda will check to see if it should upscale Mimir. This stuff gets really confusing. <laughs> So we also have something internally that's called Grafana Bench. It's weird because we have a load testing tool, but we're starting to see some of the issues with that ourselves because we are using it. For one, it doesn't have test suites, and sometimes we want to run tests. So Grafana Bench is an internal test to, an internal tool that we use 
to run K6. It's like a wrapper around K6 and actually playwright. Because even though K6 has a browser testing component, a lot of teams were already using Playwright, like the plugin development team. This is what happens when you give engineers free reign to choose the best tool. You know, sometimes you don't like the answer. <laughs> sometimes they use another tool other than the one you really want them to use. And maybe we should listen to that. <laughs> So Grafana Bench runs in local dev environments, CI CD, and rolling release channels. And it has consistent log output between K6 and Playwright. Yet another thing, we wanted, we wanted K6, the browser part of K6, to be feature at feature parity with Playwright. And it isn't quite there yet. And we're seeing that tension within the, within the company too. So Grafana Bench is a Docker image already with all of the dependencies. And I believe it was actually a hackathon project. Somebody just wanted to work on it because they were annoyed that, that these, two, these two test suites, the KSX one and the Playwright one, couldn't be executed together. There's also the engagement side of it. I think we do a lot at Grafana to make sure that we have a culture of continuous reliability. So one thing we do is that we have quarterly hackathons. I have participated in that myself. And aside from it being a cool way to work on something that you don't normally work on, it is really something that many engineers participate in. So you get to work with people as well that you wouldn't normally work with. And in fact, for the engineers that participate in hackathons, Something like 30% of them um, have participated in three or more. So this is something we look forward to. It's not like unpaid work. We get some time off for it. And 60% um, of the projects in a hackathon have moved forward in some way. They're, being, they're in active development. And 30% have been shipped. So there's a lot of bottom-up innovation from Grafana that we schedule in. Like we get calendar invites to block out time for a hackathon and everyone knows it's hackathon week. There are some really cool things that have come out of these hackathons like k Studio, there's a Grot bot and Flame Grot AI. We found out that just having these graphs doesn't mean that people know how to use them, including ourselves. It took me a long time to understand how to read a flame graph, and now there's a hackathon for that. There's actually a, a bot, an AI, an LLM, basically, that explains what the flame graph means. So dog fooding as well is highly encouraged. While we have the freedom to use whatever we want, there are going to be some raised eyebrows if you choose to use something that isn't in our stack. Because if you're not using something in our stack, why aren't you? You should feed that back to the product teams and work with them to make it actually useful for you. That, that doesn't mean, though, that we discourage competition. In fact, we don't really think of it as competition. I mean, the rising tide lifts all boats is kind of cliche, but it's true. This is why you can use Playwright to test for browser testing within Grafana. You know, this is why the our answer to Otel versus Prometheus is yes, because we want engineers to use the things that engineers want to use, and we will develop based on that. So we are very big on the big tent, this big tent philosophy. And we also highly encourage cross-pollination between teams. For example, there's an engineering manager in one team that is going on an extended leave. Instead of that person being replaced or backfilled by someone from that team, someone from the platform team, an IC, an individual contributor, is actually going to backfill that role. And we view that as a positive thing. And both people are happy. One person gets to take their leave, and the other person gets to learn something new about another team. There's also a lot of internal job opportunities that we get first as employees, and there's a lot of movement between teams, voluntary movement. 
And then there's defaulting to transparency. When I first joined K6, they have something called a week of load testing. I'm a developer advocate. I might say things that are wrong or controversial, and I don't want my opinion to be kind of filtered. So for my week of load testing, for every day, I used K6, which I, I didn't know very well, and I went through the process of installing it, of running my first test, without anyone helping me. And I didn't have all good things to say. I mean, I obviously really like it, and that's why I joined K6, but there were still some bad things that I called out. Things like, this thing isn't well documented, or that's not really the format that I want my results in as a performance engineer. And I really liked that instead of saying, don't publish it on YouTube, they said that was really good information, now work on making it better. And so my first job, <laughs> my first task, was to fix all of those things that I, had, uh, that I had identified were issues, which is, I think, a good thing. The fact that I'm here giving this talk, telling you about the things that we've done wrong, um, says a lot about how committed we are to openness and transparency. In fact, sometimes it's a little too much for some people's comfort. So let's go back to this production incident. We finally solved this mystery, and it wasn't just by turning it off and on again. The answer was there's an OSS project for that, <laughs> and its name is Pyroscope. And guess what? It's now part of the Grafana family. Pyroscope is a continuous profiler, but the cool thing is it doesn't save every single measurement. Instead, it kind of, it, you can think of it as the, that it saves the shape of memory or CPU utilization, and then it outputs it in something like a flame graph. So the red and the green stuff on the right, that's a flame graph, and in fact, this one in particular is a diff of a flame graph. It's like it takes a picture of the shape of memory utilization or CPU utilization before and after an event or those time periods that you look at. And in this case, in that case, um, we were able to find out the exact process that changed. So instead of just rebooting, we were actually able to fix it. And this is a thing that saved us the $100,000. Because of eBPF, we have this information available for everything that we start in Grafana. So it wasn't just observability. It was continuous reliability that got us there. It, was, it took a lot of cultural understanding and excitement for this new tool that you know, none of us, well, some of us didn't know that much about because it was really, it, it was really very quick when it was ad adopted into the Grafana stack. And it really takes a certain level of curiosity to be able to adopt it and, and then use it and then action it right away. Specifically, the continuous reliability forge requires these five factors. And just summarizing, it means having the right framework in place an underlying architecture that is resilient by design, and it doesn't need to be re-architected later when the system grows. O is for observability, and it means having continuous observability and having auto and manual instrumentation for as much as possible. It also means being paranoid sometimes and meta-monitoring your stuff. The forge also requires having recovery mechanisms set up so that when something goes wrong, it's you know the team that is supposed to handle it, but everybody also chips in. This is there's a process for the system to be forged and reheated and re be made ready for battle again. And it also means leaving room for growth making sure that there's enough slack between components, that there's room for testing, and for new and better measures to be implemented. And it, it is a system of making sure that regressions don't get deployed or reintroduced, and not being afraid to roll back if they do. 
continuous reliability also depends on the engagement of SREs and engineers and stakeholders and pretty much people like me who are interested in making sure that our systems keep improving. So the thing is, it's not about observability at all that is just the stepping stone to what we're actually trying to achieve. It's about continuous reliability because we still have production incidents. Our swords still break in battles, but those that do break get melted down and reforged into something better and harder and more durable. So at Grafana Labs, we watch the watchers, but then we also use what we see to move incrementally towards continuous reliability. That's it for today, because I'm short on time, but these are my slides if you'd like them and some information. If you get the slides, you can also look at the references, so I'm gonna go back to it if you're taking a photo. Um, so you can also get the references and click on all of the information that I, that I talked about. Uh, you can ask me some questions, we have some time, uh, and also, I, I, if you play Pokemon Go, I lured up all of the stops here, so you're welcome. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everyone. <laughs>